online public lecture series. First, as a reflection of this institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Palawa people as custodians of the land upon which we meet and pay our respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. My name is Dr. Emily Fleece. I'm an award-winning science communicator and lecturer at the university where I co-lead the Backyard Biodiversity Online Unit and the Healthy Landscapes Research Group where I study epidemiology and urban health ecology. This program, The Island of Ideas, is designed to keep the ideas flowing during this period when we are unable to host live public events. Each year, the university presents hundreds of lectures, forums, seminars, and workshops free of charge for our students, alumni, and the wider community. These are an important part of the university's role, and it's why we are hosting forums such as this one today. Just a few housekeeping notes before today's forum gets underway. <clears throat> Your microphone, camera, and chat function and hand raised function have all been disabled so that our speakers are not interrupted. But we do encourage you to ask questions and this can be done at any time by typing them into the Q&A function you'll see on your screens. A selection of these questions will be answered during the Q&A session after the presentations. And finally, this lecture is being recorded for later access on our YouTube and SoundCloud channels. National Threatened Species Day commemorates the death of the last known thylacine or Tasmanian tiger in 1936. It is believed the tiger died from the cold after being locked out of its sleeping quarters at the Hobart Zoo. Ne neglect may have been responsible for the demise of the last individual, but the species had already received its death sentence, despite being common in Tasmania before the European settlement in 1803. Thylacines are believed to have been driven to extinction predominantly by hunting, with habitat destruction and disease also likely to have played a role. Since 1936, other species have followed the Tazi tiger down the extinction path. National Threatened Species Day encourages us to reflect on this and to think about how to protect our unique Australian fauna and flora into the future. Today, we focus on threatened species in Tasmania and we do so in partnership with the Save the Tasmanian Devil Appeal, the most important fundraiser for the devil, delivering vital funds to high caliber research and monitoring programs. The appeal's primary focus is to support research to better understand devil facial tumor disease and its impacts on wild devil populations, to investigate strategies to protect these populations and to develop potential treatments for the disease. Our other important partner today is the Handfish Conservation Project, established to implement a recovery plan for three species found only in Southern Tasmania. We offer special thanks to all those donors to both appeals who have joined us today. You will see some information on how to donate during this presentation, and we'll hope, we hope you'll take a moment to read this. You'll be hearing today from Dr. Andy Fleece, James Pei, Jim, Jemima Stewart-Smith, and Georgina Anderson. They will be talking about devils, wedge-tailed eagles, and red handfish, and then we'll be available to take your questions. Our first speaker for today is Dr. Andy Fleece, a stunningly handsome ARC Discovery Early Career Research Fellow at the Menzies Institute for Medical Research, who you may have noticed shares my last name, country of origin, and my bet. <clears throat> in other words, full disclosure that Andy's my partner, not my brother in case that was still unclear, uh, but he will get no preferential treatment from me today. His research focuses on developing a vaccine to protect Tasmanian devils from the devil facial tumor disease. Andy, over to you. Belinda's screen is still shared. Can we switch over please? Thank you. All right. Thank you everyone for zooming in today and thank you for the opportunity to work on the Tasmanian devils and this fascinating animal and I enjoy doing this work every day. So just, hopefully a, just a second, Andy, I think you're on presenter view. What we're seeing is, is both um, your next slide and your present okay. slide and notes. Sorry about that and thank you. Yep. Um, does that look better? That looks great. Thank you. All right, so thank you again, everybody. I'll get right into it after that um, start. 
So the first image of the devil facial tumor disease was captured in 1996. And it's a horrific tumor on the face of this devil, but nobody thought too much of it at the time. A few years later, Dr. Mena Jones um, observed another devil with a similar facial tumor. And a few years later, she trapped three devils that had similar facial tumors. And it became clear that this was going to be a problem. And since that first photo in 1996, this devil facial tumor disease, the original one, or DFT1, has spread across most of the state of Tasmania, all the way to the west coast in recent years, and all the way down to the south coast, a few um, of the bit further back. Unfortunately, it's not the only transmissible cancer affecting devil face, de Tasmanian devils. This, there's a second independent type of transmissible cancer now found in the Channel region in southern Tasmania. So these are two different transmissible cancers, and Tasmanian devils are the only mammals in the world that are affected by two different transmissible cancers. And something else that is surprising to some people is that these tumors often metastasize and spread throughout the body. So what you're seeing here are lungs from a devil that died of the devil facial tumor disease. And all of these little white nodules are actually metastatic tumors in the devil's lungs. Um, so it's a lot like human cancers in that regard is that when it does really bad things, it spreads throughout the body. So a main part of the conservation research is monitoring devils in the wild and seeing what's going on. So the state government's Save the Tasmanian Devil program monitors several sites around the state to see if devil population numbers are going up and down and how much of the cancer is out there. And in most of the areas that the tumors went through, the good news is that the populations haven't disappeared. There's always some devils still hang around, so no local extinctions. Unfortunately, most of the populations have not seen recovery and they're still persisting at about 20% of the pre-devil facial tumor disease levels. So this population at Fen Fentonbury, over here, kind of towards the center of the state, has shown a little bit of a trend going upwards in recent years. So we hope we keep seeing that and we hope we start seeing some older devils in the landscape because most of what we see right now are one or two year old devils. And that means that all the three and four year old devils are being killed uh, or be devils are dying before they get to three or four years old. So how do you manage a problem like this that is pretty new to science? No option is perfect, Inactive, inaction is not really acceptable, and nobody's gonna agree on every plan. So some of the main things that have been done are to monitor the population, see what's happening in the wild, our devil populations going up and down and how much tumor is there. We also try to mitigate the problem. So roadkill is a major problem. So the Save the Devil program and others try to get people to slow down when driving at night and not run over devils. And you can also try to manage the population by potentially introducing healthy devils into an area that has been depleted by the devil facial tumor disease. Another key part of the strategy was to develop an insurance population. So there are now 700 devils in the insurance population and they live in areas where they can't get the devil facial tumor. So either in these captive facilities in Cressy or in co combination with wildlife parks and sanctuaries around the world, or on Mariah Island off the east coast of Tasmania where there's now a healthy disease-free devil population. The research of my team and others at the Medical Sciences Precinct at the University of Tasmania is focused on understanding the devil immune system and also developing a vaccine to try to prevent the devil facial tumor disease. So around 2006, um, a team led by Professor Greg Woods began looking at the immune system of Tasmanian devils. Um, and we've made a lot of progress in that time from 2006 to present day. And importantly, we found that some devils will actually have natural tumor regressions in the wild. So if we see a little facial tumor here, the first time we trap a devil, to go back later and the facial tumor is either smaller or gone, that's a really good sign. And these are pretty rare, but seeing a few of them is a good sign. Um, and Greg's team has also been able to vaccinate devils to prime the immune system. And the vaccine wasn't protective, but when they were giving a subsequent immunotherapy or something to stimulate the immune system, they were able to induce tumor regression. So really good news that the devil's immune system can kill, kill tumor cells when given the right stimulation. So the vaccine wasn't protective, so we're trying to come up with new ways to make it better. And we also need a way to distribute it across the state because trapping and injecting every devil with a vaccine is just not an option across the whole state. So something that's been used for other wildlife diseases is to actually put a vaccine in an oral bait. So you spread the bait by where the animal lives or you think the animal will be, they come out and eat it and they actually get vaccinated that way. Might sound like a bit of a crazy idea at first glance, but over 700 million of these bait vaccines have been distributed across Europe. This image shows the rabies cases in wildlife in 1990 in Europe, where every dot in red being a rabies case. 
In 2019, the blue dots are what's left of rabies. So many nations have actually eliminated rabies using this oral bait vaccine approach. And I've dropped in a little Tasmanian map right here to show you the scale that these bait vaccines have been used on. So it's a pretty massive scale. If you're interested in a more of a lay summary of how these oral bait vaccines work, there was a really nice article in National Geographic recently, and we're working with several of the team members that run that project in the state. So we have good guidance in our vaccine development. So what this looks like at a little bit lower level is to make a bait vaccine, you have to put something on the outside of it that devils like to sniff out and they like to eat. And then on the inside of that, you use an attenuated virus. So in rabies, you put parts of the rabies virus in there that are non-harmful. For the devil facial tumor vaccine, we'll put proteins in there that are found on devil facial tumor cells. So when the immune system sees the virus, it also sees parts of the devil facial tumor and then they can develop immune memory so they can kill tumor cells. Vaccines have been in the news a lot this year and everybody's very keen to get back to work and normal life and a vaccine against COVID-19 would certainly do that. Three of the leading COVID-19 vaccines that are in development and now in phase three trials are based on an attenuated adenovirus. So this is a virus that most people have been exposed to some sort of it in their lifetime. It can cause conjunctivitis or symptoms like the common cold. So for COVID, you modify the virus to look a little bit like COVID. And it's the same type of attenuated virus that we're using for the devil facial tumor vaccine, but instead of putting COVID parts in, we're putting a little bit of dev devil facial tumor cells in it. So the first question that we asked was, can this attenuated virus actually infect and kill devil facial tumor cells? And what we see over here in green is that when we infect the cells with the virus, it makes the cells green. So we know that the virus has got in there and it's been able to deliver the, the antigens or the, the vaccine components that we want. And importantly, it also kills the devil facial tumor cells. So that's a really good secondary aspect of this. So this is a big first step that we've got out of the way right away. We published this strategy in a publication in Expert Review of Vaccines that outlines what we want to do and why we want to do it. So you can read more about it there if you want. A quick overview shows that if they bite into the vaccine bait, the virus should infect possibly through a gingival crevice or through a wound in the mouth. And once the virus gets in, it can make some of the devil facial tumor proteins. The immune system will see the virus, kill the virus, and in the process, hopefully develop memory against the devil facial tumor cells. Another important part of this vaccine is that when the devil bites into it, it spills into their mouth. And a lot of the devil facial tumors form inside the mouth of the devils. So if this vaccine spilled directly into these devil facial tumor cells in the mouth, it could kill them directly and draw a lot of immune cells in there to start killing the tumor cells. So it's really a one-two punch with this approach. And that's one of the reasons that we're very excited about it. So it's a pretty tall order making this vaccine. Yes, it's very ambitious, but our team has come a long ways since 1996 when this disease was first discovered from 2006 when they were determined to be transmissible cancers. We're now doing some of the high-tech molecular immunology work that's done in the human clinic and we can even take a drop of blood from Tasmanian devils, put a few, spike a few tumor cells into it, and then pull those tumor cells back out. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, if you think of where's Wally and trying to find this little tiny Wally in amongst all of those people, that's what we're doing with the devil facial tumor cells, except we can go through 10,000 of these maps in a second and find the tumor cell in each one of them. So the high tech technology is really coming into play and in speeding our vaccine research. So with devils, disease is obviously a major problem that's driving the devil population down. But normally when extinction occurs or threatening species are threatened, it's due to a lot of factors. And one of the biggest factors in Australia is introduced animals. So the darker the, the area on the map here, it's the more species have went extinct due to that particular cause. So with introduced animals on the mainland, it's foxes, cats, and dogs are a lot of those. Um, and it's the same in Tasmania with cats being a major problem. So we all need to do our part for conservation. We can develop a perfect vaccine, but it won't save the devil if we don't start modifying our behavior and start protecting our threatened species. So my advice is to get out and enjoy what's in your own backyard. These videos were caught with a trail camera in my own backyard. So there's actually Tasmanian devils coming through Lena Valley. So if you're driving through Lena Valley or other parts of Tasmania at night, go slow. You don't want to run over one of these. There's other wonderful species out there too. So we caught this Australian water rat on video too. It's a really neat species, but what we catch mostly on the video are cats. And these cats could be killing the water rat babies, they could go after young devils and a lot of other birds and, and precious Tasmanian species. So 
I'll leave you with, there's very good news in devil conservation. We find that the immune system can kill devil facial tumor cells. There's no local extinctions of devils. And we have an exciting bait vaccine project in development. And technology has really allowed us to speed up our research. Critical to all of this has been the support of the Save the Dev Tasmanian Devil Appeal and support from the community. So thank you for this opportunity. Thanks so much, Andy. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen, I'll introduce our next speaker. Try to figure that out. Where did it go? <laughs> so our next speaker is Dr. James Pei, a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Tasmania, who is also stunningly handsome, by the way. See, Andy gets no special treatment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thanks, uh, hi, James. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, James's research is focused on the conservation biology of the Tasmanian wedge-tailed eagle and includes the GPS tracking of eagles, some of which he'll be showing us today. Thanks, James. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, so I'll be talking about some of the research we've been doing on these awesome birds, uh, the Tasmanian wedge-tailed eagles. But yeah, as Emily said, I'm going to focus on, I guess, the cooler stuff um, that we're doing, um, which is using some fancy technology to well, basically spy on the birds to see what they get up to. So as a very quick intro, um, wedge-tailed eagles are found throughout Australia. Um, there are currently two recognized subspecies though, although there's some genetic evidence to suggest that this shouldn't be the case. Uh, but for this, for this presentation, we're considering them two separate subspecies. Um, so in green, we've got the Aquila audax audax, which is found throughout mainland Australia and also this little dot at the top in Southern New Guinea. And then we've got our Tasmanian population, um, which is endemic down here. Um, and our population is listed as, a, as endangered both at a state and federal level. Um, so I've just got this slide summarizing at least some of the reasons for that threatened status. Uh, first of all, we don't think there's many of the birds. Um, 1,000 to 1,500 was the last estimate, um, but that's from 20 years ago. So we do need a bit of an update on that. They suffer from a low breeding success rate, which basically means if an adult breeding pair lay an egg, the chances of that egg becoming an illegal or quite a big eagle um, that fledges the nest is quite low. Um, and this is linked to their sensitivity to disturbance where if people get too close to their nests, um, they freak out and they'll leave their nest, which means that the chick or egg can die. I've got habitat loss in here, um, but this, concern at the moment is based exclusively on nesting habitat because we only know where the nests are. Uh, they love old growth forest and big trees, but we know very little about what they use for other behaviors um, and during other life stages. So they don't start breeding until they're three to five years old. So what habitats they're using before that period. And then I've grouped a whole bunch of things together with some pretty pictures um, on the right for causes of unnatural mortality. So poor eagles do get um, hit by turbines, they crash into power lines, they get hit by cars, um, they suffer from intentional and unintentional poisoning. So there's a lot of things that are influencing their survival. And we think this is predominantly an issue in young birds because a lot of the birds we're finding dead or injured are what we call immature, so they're not yet breeding. Now there's a bunch of research going on um, from various groups actually addressing each of these different um, concerns, um, but where the GPS tracking work that we're doing focuses is mostly on these last two. So we can use the GPS tracking to work out what habitats, where the birds are, what they're doing in those habitats. And then we can also look at how many die, what do they die of, to look at these unnatural causes of mortality. And as I'll show later on, we can also use the technology to develop ways to try and reduce these causes of mortality. So this is a lovely picture of Handsome Bob, who's modeling one of the GPS tracking units for us. So it's fitted like a little backpack, sits in the middle of his back there. And it's a little box, um, that black um, kind of rectangle on the back there um, is a solar panel. So this keeps the units powered for a long period of time. We're hoping to get, well, we should get five years, but hopefully we should get 10 years of data, which is amazing. And the data they collect itself is a bit kind of, um, well, it's like GPS, uh, like Google Maps. It uh, collects a GPS fix every 15 minutes. Um, and then once a day, they collect the mobile phone data network and send that information to me, which makes my field work really easily. And I get a whole bunch of text messages from Eagles um, every day. In fact, I will be getting them in a few minutes, but my phone is turned off. Um, and so we've got the technology that we want to use, but I guess the big question is how do we capture the birds to put the transmitters on? Because 
um, eagles are quite scary looking and they move around a lot. So how do we catch them? And the thing here is because they last so long with the solar panel, we wanted to capture them as early as possible so that we got as many information on as many life stages as we could. So we got them just before they left the nest. And I'm hoping this video isn't too jumpy, um, but it should show somebody much braver than me about 50 meters up a, net, uh, up a tree with the eagle nest just below him there. And um, that's an echidna sitting on the nest there, not the eagle. And then if uh, he pokes his head around the other side of the tree, we'll get to see one of the eagles we're tracking. So there's Emma sitting on a nest, wondering what on earth this human is doing above her. So then the tree climber climbs down, picks up little Emma, little Emma, she's a, almost a fully grown eagle, big Emma, shall we say, um, tucks her into this bag and then lowers her down to the ground. And it's on the ground that we fit the GPS tracker. This is a different bird having his GPS tracker um, fitted, Wallera. And this takes quite a while because we need to make sure it's fitted correctly. Um, then this, they get some well-earned lunch for their troubles. And then this is Emilio, another eagle, getting released back onto the nest. And the look on his face is amazing. He's like, what on earth has just happened? So then we put him back on the nest and he stays on the nest probably for another one to two weeks before he finally makes that first flight out of the nest and starts collecting that important information on what they actually do and what habitats they're using. Here he is making himself look as big and scary as possible to scare Dave the tree climber off. And Dave takes the hint. So using these techniques, uh, we've managed to catch 25 birds during this research. The birds in blue, so Walden, Wilbur, Wanda, Wolger, Winifred, Wyatt, Willow and Wallera, we've been tracking for coming up to four years now. And then all the birds beginning with E, we've been tracking for coming up to three years. And I thought we'd first of all get the, the sad stuff out of the way. Um, so we've had five confirmed mortalities. Uh, young Wilbur up in the uh, northeast was hit by a car. Little Eugene um, crashed into a paddock fence. Egbert had some pretty horrendous, uh, with the photo at the top there, um, kidney disease, uh, which caused him to die. And then, although I love devils, um, and I'm not going to upset Andy by bad-mouthing them too much, they do make my fieldwork quite difficult because they beat me to Erica and Ellen, so they'd scavenged them too much for me to get the cause of death which was a bit annoying. But although this is kind of, well, obviously very bad news for those five eagles, it's good news overall because we thought that during their first year of life, they'd have a much higher mortality, up to 50%. So we're doing much better than that. Now this video shows what the GPS data looks like. This is from Wolger, who is here in the Midlands. So the little blue dots are the GPS fixes and there she is sat on her nest and this just shows just over the first month after she leaves the nest, she gradually travels further and further away from the nest as she basically gets better at being an eagle. But as well as being in two dimensions, the data importantly is also in three dimensions, which gives us a really cool insight into their flying behavior, which will become important later on when I talk about some of these ways to reduce collisions. One of the ways that we have been looking at the data um, is to use some fancy models to classify these tracks that we're getting into different behaviors so we can work out what behaviors are using what habitats. And this video should summarize what I mean by this. So this is Emma, the bird that um, Dave was climbing down on top of in the nest. And I've color coded her tracks based on three different behavioral states, perching in red, short flights in green, long flights in blue. And if I highlight out um, forest in green there and then the open habitats in this yellowy color, we can see that the perching and short flights are more strongly associated with the edges of these forest patches, which is one of the first things that jumped out with the data. And then the second one we've looked at here is the steepness of the slope. So all three of the behaviors, but again, in particular, the red and green perching and short flights are strongly associated with these steeper slopes. Now we can also look at the particular characteristics of each of those behaviors. So the take home message from this slide is basically that short flights unsurprisingly occur at a much lower altitude um, than long flights. But the reason it's particularly, particularly important is if I overlay 
On top of this, uh, the range and heights of power lines in Tasmania, we can see that short flights sit right in the middle there. And we can kind of conclude that short flights are going to be a risky behavior for the birds to be performing. So what we've then done is used the GPS tracking and our models to predict where um, these short flights are likely to occur in Tasmania. So here's a satellite image of a, a random spot I picked in the middle of the of Midlands and Highlands. And over the top of this, we can overlay the model. Um, so the lighter colors here, the pink, uh, pinks and yellows are where the short flights are more likely to happen. And then again, if I can put in these white lines represent the power lines that are in this area, we can pick out the areas that may be more risky. So like up here and around here. And this information is useful because we can then guide where we put things that help reduce the chances of eagles crashing into power lines. So often driving around Tasmania, you see these little bird flappers, they're called, um, that TAS networks put up to make the uh, power lines more visible to the eagles and reduce the chances of them crashing into it. And then finally, I've put this, uh, this all this previous work is what we've been working on over the last three years. Um, but I've also got this last um, slide just to show how, um, as always, technology keeps improving. Um, but one thing that's been amazing over the last year is that we can now get GPS fixes every six seconds. So we can see this is Malu up in the Northeast flying around his territory, looking a bit lost. He's not lost, he's a, a territory, territorial eagle. So he's just flying around his, his home. Um, but this detailed information will help us improve these models to really get a better insight into what these birds are doing when they're flying and also where those risky flights are likely to occur. And that's me done. Thanks. Thanks so much, James. Um, and I want to commend uh, Evie Jones and Lindell White uh, and another person who have figured out the Q&A um, function here. So everyone else, if you have questions, just jot them down there as the panelist is speaking and we'll come to those at the end of the four presentations. So keep doing that. All right, thanks for um, stopping sharing your screen, James. Uh, next up, we have Jamina Stewart-Smith, a marine biologist at the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania and the CSIRO. She coordinates the Handfish Conservation Project within the Marine Biodiversity Hub of the National Environmental Science Program. Jamina, if you want to start sharing your slides. Thanks, Emily. You're up next. Is that okay? Great. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about specifically about red handfish conservation, but given it's threatened species day and half of all known handfish species are now considered endangered, I'll start by giving a general sort of overview on all handfish species. So handfish are, let me see if I can play that. Handfish are a small marine fish and a type of anglerfish. Most people are quite familiar with anglerfish. They have this structure on the top of their head called an elysium, which is thought to function as a type of fishing lure to attract prey. And you can see it on this video of a little red handfish there. So true to their name, handfish have these fins that resemble hands and they use their, their fins or their hands for walking ac across the seafloor rather than swimming like, like most fish do. So handfish are only found in southeastern Australia but they're kind of found in a variety of habitats. So you get some that are found in deep water, some that are in shallow water, some on rocky reefs, and some are on sandy, silty areas. And there are 14 species of handfish, most of them found in and around Tasmania and nowhere else in the world. So earlier this year, the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, updated their red list of threatened species to include all 14 handfish species. And they're all listed here in front of you. And I'll just quickly run through the main categories there. So we've got five species listed as data deficient. And that really means that we don't have enough information to be able to tell whether they're threatened or not. So that in itself is, is something to be really concerned about. There's one species, the Australian handfish, that's listed as least concerned, so it's not considered to be threatened. We've got four species listed as endangered and three species listed in, as critically endangered. And they're the ones that I primar primarily focus on. That's the red, the spotted and the zebels. 
And there's one species that was listed as extinct, which is the smooth hamfish. And you've probably heard a little bit about that in the media. It was quite a significant milestone. It's the first marine bony fish to be listed as extinct globally. But this listing assessment really also um, means that hand fishes are now considered to be the most threatened family of marine bony fish on the planet of, of all those that have been assessed. And I just guess to give a little bit more context around those listings, I've included a timeline that shows the last time that each of those species was seen. And at the top of that timeline, you'll see that the smooth handfish there listed um, was last and, and only seen in the early 1800s. And if you move down the list, what you'll see is towards the bottom in the last 20 years, we've only seen four handfish species around. So the zebels, the Australian, the red and the spotted three of those which are critically endangered. And that's a, um, that's a picture of a zebel's handfish there. It's one of the larger handfishes. It gets to around 15 centimetres. So what are the key threatening processes to handfishes? Now, I mentioned that some were deep water and some were shallow and some lived in seaweed on reefs and some were in silty areas. So specific threats depend on where they, where they actually live. But broadly speaking, the threats to handfishes include um, habitat loss and degradation. So things like pollution, siltation and urban development. Um, impacts of invasive species are thought to be important. Ecological interactions that have resulted in imbalances in the ecosystem is also thought to be important, as well as things like climate change, fishing and human disturbance. Now, you might take a look at those threats and sort of think, well, there are lots of species, lots of marine species that are subject to those threats. So what is it about handfish that makes them particularly vulnerable? Why have they been hit so hard? And the thing about that is that handfish possess a bunch of life history characteristics that make them vulnerable to environmental change. So they've got, they have few, produced few, few eggs, they have no planktonic larval stage and their locomotion as mentioned is, is by walking. So that means that their dispersal capability is extremely limited. So if there are impacts on the environment, if the if their habitat becomes degraded, they really have no way of getting away or moving away from, from those disturbances. On top of that, we now have these small fragmented or separated populations. So that means they've got really low genetic diversity. And because the populations are small, those threats are acting across their entire range. So there's no, there are no insurance populations or, or populations that are safe from those threats. I'll quickly touch on um, red handfish. So these are the ones that I mainly focus on. And as Emily mentioned, we started the handfish conservation project in 2000, late 2018. And that really focuses on those three critically endangered species, the red, the spotted and the zebels. The red handfish is thought to be on the brink of extinction. There are quite a small species. They're only seven or eight centimetres in length. When they hatch, they're at about three millimetres and they live in shallow rocky reefs. They live in seaweed, so in seaweed or seagrass, which they use for shelter and to lay their eggs on. And currently there are thought to be only two small populations with fewer than 100 adults left between those. So we've noticed like not only are these population's really small, but there's been a decline in population numbers and there's been an increase in their habitat degradation. So what are we doing about that? One of the things that we're doing, one of our conservation strategies is called a head starting strategy. And for this, what we did was we collected clutches of eggs, red handfish eggs from the wild, and we hatched them in captivity at IMAS. And we've been growing the juveniles up in, cap in captivity. The idea behind this strategy is that you protect the young or the early life stages when they're at their most vulnerable to things like predation or susceptible to adverse environmental conditions. So we've provided, the idea is to provide these ideal conditions for growth and survival. So we're controlling the conditions, we're limiting the threats and we're providing them with an abundant food supply. The thing about this strategy is that it's a really high risk strategy. It's not one that you would opt into if you had lots of options on the table. It really is a last resort. It's going quite well so far. We have over 50 juveniles in captivity and we're hoping to do our first release later this year. 
one of the other things that we're doing is managing the key stresses on their habitat. And one of the, I guess, I guess one of the key stresses is an increase in the native urchins, the short-spined urchins, which eat the seaweed and the seagrass that the handfish need. So we've been monitoring urchin populations over the past few years through the Reef Life Survey Program. And a month ago, we had um, we implemented some removals of urchins from around the handfish habitat. And that was done through the Tasmanian Commercial Divers Association. And that's what those two pictures on the bottom there are, they're urchin collections. And that's just one day of urchins, uh, urchin removals from two of the ham both of the handfish sites. On top of the habitat management and the head starting, we're also can continue continuing to improve our search and monitoring. We've got a PhD student, Tyson Bessel, who's developing environmental DNA techniques so that we can hopefully use water samples to improve our search and monitoring for, the, for red and other species of handfish. And Tyson's also doing a mark recapture study to help us build on the biological and ecological information that we need on the species. And currently that's actually one of our priorities because there's not a whole lot of information known about red handfish. And just to sum up, our other priorities are continuing that head starting and captive, looking into captive breeding as options for bolstering the wild populations, continuing to monitor those remaining populations while we're also trying to minimise or mitigate those human impacts and continue to restore their habitat. I think that's me. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much, Jamina, for sharing that um, that interesting information as well as uh, for what you're doing for the red handfish. Okay, next up we have a special treat um, to introduce our fourth panelist today, Dr. Georgina Anderson. Uh, we'll show you a remarkable video that Georgina helped produce on the secret life of the Tasmanian devil. Alternate title is, this is what it looks like when a devil gets hold of a GoPro camera. Right, I think, is Belinda sharing that one? Oh, here we go. Fantastic. Um, well, that's the last uh, that we have uh, planned from the panelists. So now it's time for the Q&A. And I'd like to start with a Tazzy Devil question. Um, this one was just brought up by Anne Giles. She says, the Facebook page, Tasmanian Devil Network, has a number of members using trail cams. 
to observe devil behavior on their properties. One member has even collected 20 years worth of devil scats from his shack in Golden Valley, where the devils use his front door as a latrine site. Lucky him. Would devil researchers be interested in hearing about the findings from these citizen science scientists? And if so, who should they contact? Um, and that Anne is the moderator of the Tasmanian Devil Network. So I'm going to uh, start with Georgina on that one, um, because you've obviously got an interest in um, video recordings of the Tassie Devils. Do you guys interact with citizen scientists and um, how can people get you that sort of information? Um, well, I actually collected lots of scats statewide a few years ago and investigated their diet. Um, so I've sort of finished that study now. But yeah, I'm always interested to hear what um, citizens have to say. So you can either contact me um, at georgina.anderson at utes.edu.au and I can pass on the information to um, my supervisor, Mena Jones, who might be interested in that sort of information. Andy, do you have anything else you want to say about connecting with citizen scientists or people who use trail cams for devil yeah, research? I think what Georgina said, contacting Mana Jones or Rodrigo Hamidi would be very good. And the Save the Devil program um, also has a hotline that you can call um, for roadkill and things like that. So anybody that wants to reach out and, and supply useful information can, can Google and find the Save the Tasmanian Devil program hotline. Cool. Um, two, two questions here for James uh, from Lindell and an anonymous attendee. They're wondering how you deal with uh, growth. So you're putting the cameras or the GPS trackers on the eagles when they're juveniles. Um, do they grow a lot after that? And if so, how do you adjust their backpack and straps and how does that work? Yeah, that's an awesome question. So we had to um, go to the nest at a very specific time of their development so that they're almost fully grown, um, but they're not able to fly out of the nest. So they'll just fly off. Um, so they, after we put the trackers on, they have a little bit of development to do in the muscles um, because they'll get stronger as their wings start being used a lot. Um, so we fit the transmitters allowing, um, there's kind of a standard rule where you allow two fingers to be able to fit underneath uh, the backpack so that when they grow um, it just makes the, the backpack tight uh, like will fit correctly rather than be loose. I also had a question about um, when the when you were putting the backpack on one of the juvenile eagles there was an echidna in the nest is that <laughs> yeah. is that a normal food item for the eagles did we know that they were eating echidnas? I, I don't think to the extent like we one of the good uh, one of the telltale signs of actually being near to a wedge-tailed eagle nest was if we were looking up trying to find the nest um, and we'd just find bits of echidna hanging in the trees um, so that for some reason I guess they're quite an easy prey item to to get even though they're spiny and difficult to deal with um, but we didn't expect them to be that many so in 2018 there was a lot of echidna on uh, wedge-tailed eagle nests I, yeah, I was surprised by that. I met, I just, I don't know how they, how do they get them with all the, yeah. all the spines? How do they get around that? No idea. Okay. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> uh, somebody else's research project. Um, one of the early questions we had come in is for Andy. Uh, how do you manage the dosage of the vaccines? You talked about the creation or that you're working on of this oral bait vaccine. So if you put these baits around, how do you manage what sort of dose the devils get? Yeah, that's a very good question and something that we'll have to spend a lot of time working on. And we can build on a, a lot of the previous research and experiments. So as I said before, there's been about 700 million of these oral baits um, spread across Europe and well over 100 million in, in the US. And there's different ways of doing this, of monitoring the, the dosage or uptake. So initially they would put a drug called doxycycline in the oral baits. And when animals eat it, the drug would get into their system and it would stay around for a long time in the teeth. Um, so with raccoons, they were less concerned about them and they go pull the tooth out. And if they had doxycycline, they know they got, um, they could estimate the dosage they got. We don't want to do that with devils. Um, you can use another compound called rhodamine B that gets taken up in the whiskers. So you could actually snip a whisker and see if it's getting uptake. Um, but there's another way we can do it with just a little blood sample. Um, it's called iophenoxic acid. So we can get an estimate that way, but it's very imperfect. So um, of delivering the full dose. It's not like sticking a needle in the, in the arm of a person and getting the full dose in. So what we're doing is we're looking at how devils eat. 
Um, so how they hold it, and we want to get something that devils can crack into, but maybe not other species. So devils are the ones most likely to consume the bait. We want it to get a good spread in their mouth as soon as they break through it and have the, the vaccine spread around the out mouth and also to maximize retention time in the mouth. So we're working with a researcher from the University of Otago that has done um, possum biocontrol and, and thinks of things like this. So we really, uh, my expertise is looking at the immune systems. So we're bringing in the people necessary to answer these questions and try to get the dose optimized as much as possible. But it is difficult when you're leaving something in the environment for, for an animal to eat. Well, there's a follow-up question then here from Tanya uh, Rose Warren. She says, uh, are there, what are the issues for non-target species with this type of bait vaccine? Yeah, so we, we want to look into if other animals could be in, infected with the vaccine and if it would have negative effects on them. So the other animals that would be most likely to eat it would be quolls um, and possums, probably. Um, I don't think cats would be, and we're probably not too concerned about those in Tasmania. We don't want them to die a horrible death, but um, cats are a problem here. So we'll look at ways that we can modify the shape of it and the scent to try to get devils there and other species. But we can also do some tests of testing this attenuated virus in quolls, in possums. Um, and generally, as I said, it's a pretty weak virus. So um, most people and a lot of animals around the world are exposed to some type of adenovirus and it doesn't usually make them sick. So we'll do the initial testing on that. Um, and we'll also have hopefully some automated bait dispensers. So if a devil comes, they can't just eat 20 baits at once. They can take one, and then when the devil leaves, a new bait will be put out. And we can also limit other species that way, so making sure that a quoll doesn't come by and eat all the baits. Okay, I'm going to stick with the devil for a minute, um, but this one's for Georgina. What are the reasons from uh, Selena Kosak? What are the reasons for mounting the GoPro under the devil as opposed to on top? Um, that's to do with how the devil moves. So when it walks through the landscape, it often ducks under branches and it goes into dens. So if it was on the top, the, the camera would get knocked too much and then it would be like on the side and you'd get, you know, wonky footage. So yeah, it made more sense just to put it under the neck. Have you um, done any other camera attachments? Tried, tried different positions or is this the sort of first attempt? Uh, this was the first attempt and we just thought it would be the best one. <laughs> and yeah, it worked quite well. <laughs> Yeah. You just see the, yeah, what the devil sees, but just through the devil's chin whiskers, which is quite funny. Yeah. Are there plans to do more of them? Because it is really neat to see things from the devil point of view. Yeah, there might be something in the works. <laughs> <laughs> Top secret, it sounds like. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> so here's one from D Man for Jam uh, Jamima. Jamina. I don't know why I have so much trouble. Sorry. <laughs> Jamina. Um, how will you track the survival rate of the translocated captive bred handfish. Um, can you do that? Can you identify, uh, individually identify them uh, before release? And what are the efforts in that space? Yep, so for adults, we can do that. And that's part of what our Tyson, our PhD students, Mark Recapture study is on. So you can use, they have these unique spots on the, or markings on the side of their body. So we're using photographs to identify individuals. By the time that we release the juveniles, they perhaps won't be big enough for those markings to be set. Um, so we are trialling some tagging methods and that we're using the same sort of taggings that they've used quite quite commonly, I guess, for seahorses. So it's a small, tiny little dot of elastomer that's implanted just under their skin. So we're trialling that because it is important for us to be able to see that they are surviving after we've released them. Um, and a related question, do we know why the urchin populations have been growing so much and end up threatening the handfish? Yeah, we're not really sure about what the what the exact drivers are for those increases in, in the urchin populations. It's something that we really need more information on. Um, and then another one from Ruby about red handfish. So she's wondering um, if you've considered involving the community through community engagement programs to foster interest in the species and to, prom to promote um, information about how endangered they are, uh, specifically possibly targeting the industries that are impacting them uh, to help raise awareness. Are there any efforts like that that you know of? Yeah, and um, Margot also had a similar question about how the public can help. And I think at this point, I mean, the project is so young that increasing or raising the profile of the species and the project is, is really important at this stage for us being able to be able to facilitate conservation action. So the public getting behind our, you know, even our Facebook posts and our Twitter page and, and that kind of thing is really important because it shows that we've got that momentum. 
Um, and another point there is we did actually study, and one of the other questions there was by Maggie, one of our red hamfish sponsors. So we started up a name a hamfish campaign for those remaining 100 adults, and, and Maggie was one of the sponsors there who named her fish Optimist. And, and so hopefully I answered your other question, Maggie, about being able to track those adults in the wild, and hopefully uh, we'll get to see Optimist again and, and let you know about that. That's, thank you for translating that one. I was wondering what she meant yeah. by optimist. Okay. Um, so people can sponsor individual handfish and, like and, and name them. And, and name them, yeah. Ah, fun. Okay, I've got some more here about the vaccine. Um, one of them, I'm not, I'm not sure what exactly is meant by this, but Andy, you might. They're wondering if you've considered uh, the, the capybaras capybara's immunity against fighting cancers, perhaps or maybe they're, they get cancer at really low rates, I don't know. Um, and if that's a way of developing the vaccine, if, if we can, I'll, so answer if you specifically know about the capybaras, but if not, are we drawing from information about other species about how to develop this vac vaccine? Andy, you're muted. So yep. that question is so from Genesis? Yeah. Genesis? So thanks for the question. I don't have specific insight into the, the capybara. Um, most cancer research starts in rodents and the capybara is the biggest rodent. So that could be an interesting model. But what I will say is that um, most species on the planet do get cancer. Um, and one of the, the things that I'm helping to lead is something called the Wild and Comparative Immunology Consortium. And what we're trying to do is integrate wildlife research and infectious disease and cancer research and other species into mainstream immunology and not using these as, as test lab rats, but actually trying to help them from a conservation point of view of finding out why these diseases happen um, and also using that to inform how the human immune system could work. So we really see fertile ground for crossover. Um, about every five or 10 years, a new species comes out that this species is resistant to cancer or this species can do it all, their immune system. and there isn't any that I've found that to be the case. So about 20 years ago, people said sharks didn't get cancer, and it turns out they do. And about five years ago, people said elephants don't get much cancer, and new research shows that elephants get a lot of cancer, and um, zoo veterinarians have known that for a long time. And mole rats are current, naked mole rats are currently one of the species that some people say don't get cancer at all, but the mole rats at Walt Disney World did get cancer, four of them. So. There's no magic bullet, but I think the more species that we look at and look at their immune system, the better idea we'll get generally of how the immune system works and how animals can fight cancer effectively. So um, the more we learn about any species, the more we'll, we'll help all species. And there's a question here um, from Simon Watson. Uh, if we know the origin of the viruses that impact on the devil, um, and I think, I think that's referring to the transmissible tumor, which is a, a tumor cell that's transmit, transmitted, which makes it so unique. Um, but do we know why devils then have this, um, have two transmiss, transmissible cancers when that is such a unusual thing to happen in the wild? So why devils? Yeah, so that, that's uh, an interesting question. So as Emily said, um, it's not a virus causing the cancer. So with most a lot of the cancers that people get, like cervical cancer, is often associated with uh, papillomavirus. So a lot of viruses can cause cancer. But this one with the devils, um, it's the actual tumor cells that are being transmitted, which is why it's so unique and why you don't see this very often. So the initial hypotheses were mostly focused around Tasmanian devils. It's a relatively small island population with limited genetic diversity. And it means it's like um, when, the, when a cell tries to get transferred from one individual to the next, it's kind of like being transferred from a sister to a brother or to a cousin. And it, it's not quite that genetically similar, but they, they are fairly genetically similar. So if you get a tissue transplant, you'd want to get it from somebody that's genetically matched. So with devils, that was the, the idea first. Um, and that does play a role. But there are other things that are driving this, what we call immune evasion that allows these tumor cells to escape destruction by the immune system. So that's really what we're focusing on is trying to find out exactly how that does happen and then um, target those mechanisms. Um, Georgina, did you wanna add anything? I think you covered it pretty well, Andy. Okay, um, James, a question from Kate Hibbert. 
your monitor eagles are at the breeding age now. Are you seeing them settle down? Do they establish a range and nest in the years between leaving the nest that they're born in and when they start breeding, um, then stay there to breed? Or do they move around to seek a mate? What are we learning about that stage of their life and that process? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so yeah, most of the analyses we've done so far has been on this period where they stay with their parents um, after they leave the nest and then they start uh, dispersal where they end up flying around the Tasmanian landscape for about three to five years, we think. Um, and of the birds we're tracking, one of one bird, Wolger, um, looks like she has settled in a territory. I need to go out there and check um, to see if there is a nest there. Um, but recent, yeah, she's been in the same spot for about six months. Um, so if she bred, she would have been, yeah, she's just ticked over. So she's coming up to four years. Um, but none of the other birds have settled yet. So they're still flying around uh, the landscape. But once they settle in a territory, they'll probably stay there. Okay, and then there's um, two questions I'm gonna combine here. So we got one earlier from Len Doherty from the Mountain Valley Wilderness Holidays and in, in Private Nature Reserve. And he says there's some uh, development by TAS Networks in the Northwest and they wanna put in some power lines where he knows of a family of three eagles and also some goshawks that have been living in that area for about 40 years. Uh, and the proposed developments might encroach on their flight paths and remove some of the tall trees that they use for perching. Um, so combining this with Marianne Bennett's question, what do we know about, you know, you know so we're, we all use electricity and power and we're having this conversation over Zoom. So we do need some of those things, but what do we know about how to minimize the um, impact that power lines can have on, uh, on our birds of prey. Yeah, so there's, and TAS Networks is doing a bunch of stuff for this. Um, so as well as colliding with the power lines, um, the big, big birds, both uh, gray goshawks and wedge-tailed eagles can sit on the power line posts. And then when they go to take off, they make a connection and then get electrocuted. Um, but there's modifications that TAS networks can put in place um, that reduce the chances of these happening. So they can put um, insulators on the poles and then those flappers that I showed in the presentation to reduce the chances of the birds colliding. Um, but all this stuff's super expensive. So that's where we're trying to come in to help guide where we prioritize putting those, um, those things. Um, and yeah, with the, I'm not quite sure on the exact development in the Northwest, but there will be regulations that they have to adhere to when they're putting that development in. So they won't be able to put anything within um, 500 meters of a, a nest, an eagle nest that is. Um, but yeah, it's, we're still looking at, we've only recently started tracking adults to know what, how far they range from their nest uh, to actually know what, um, whether the current regulations do enough or not enough. Um, yeah, so it's, we're doing our best, um, but as we get more information, we can do better. And can you also apply that to wind turbines? What do we know about um, how we can prevent them from colliding with wind turbines? Yeah, so there were, in fact, there was a recent paper that came out where they'd done a cool thing of painting one of the blades black and showed that, that reduced the number of birds that had collided with the wind turbines. Uh, but one of the things we're trying to develop is a model that specifically shows where birds fly um, within the altitudes that a wind turbine blades occur at. Uh, so rather than dealing with the issue subsequently, um, whilst before the wind uh, farms are built, we can guide the placement of those um, turbines and indeed the placement of the entire farms because there's going to be certain spots in Tasmania where we get a lot of young birds flying through that just wouldn't be a very good spot for a wind farm no matter what. Okay, I've got one here for Jamina. Um, Megan Alessandrini says, it sounds like your team have their work cut out for them. What steps can be taken to reduce the habitat damage and how can the general public and recreational fishers help with this? Yeah, so that's something that um, we're trying to look at through the National Hamfish Recovery Team, sort of prioritising what steps we can do to reduce damage on the habitat. I mean, as mentioned, we're looking at the urchins first because that's one of the key immediate issues. And the idea, I guess, one of Tyson's chapters as well as developing a risk assessment for us to be able to prioritise the steps that need to be taken. So we have a whole bunch of things underway and a whole bunch of things that we do need doing. I guess at this point, we need the public to be open to those conversations. And, and like I said before, to help try and raise the profile of the species in the project. 
Is there anything in particular that recreational fisher people um, can be doing or, or should do or keep in mind? Um, well, we've, like I said, we were in, um, working with the commercial urchin fishers there to um, mm -hmm. keep on top of the urchin numbers and they've actually been really, it's been a really good collaboration because they can see the benefit of the project and, and obviously the urchins are useful for their, fisher, for their fishery. Um, we've got plans to work with recreational fishers down the track as well and have those conversations, but we're not sure at this point exactly how we'll move forward with that. I have one here from John Cunning that's uh, about the devils and I'll start with Georgina on this one. And John is just wondering about the future of the species of the Tasmanian devils. So for a while there was concerns that they were going to go extinct. Is that still um, something that people are predicting or, or what do we think is going to happen to them in the longer term? Well, even though we've lost um, a lot of devils since the devil faced tumor emerged in 1996, they're still persisting. So, um, where it started in the east coast of Tasmania, it spread towards the west. So, the west is the only place where it's disease free at the moment. But even on the east coast, where um, the devils have been diseased for a long time, it, yeah, the, the numbers are still okay. Um, and devils are starting to breed earlier. And, like Andy said in the sl slide, um, some devils are showing signs of resistance to the tumor. So the devil seems to be hanging on. Um, so yeah, I think you know, until we get a vaccine, we just have to, yeah, hope that the devils just still do their thing and, and yeah, <laughs> survive. Anything you want to add, Andy? Uh, yep, I, I, I agree with Georgina said, and generally it's, we're, we're much more optimistic than we were 10 or 15 years ago when this really started breaking. The discovery of the second tumor in 2014 was, was not good. And that one is you know, still relatively confined in the South, but we don't know what that one's gonna do. So that's a bit of a, an unknown in it, but the things we can do are drive slow at night, keep the dogs on lead when you're in the bush and keep the cats inside and let people know that the devils are out there and other endangered species are out there and that you care about them. and. Um, you want them to be around for future generations. Okay, I'm going to stay on the devils for a minute, but you know, Andy or Georgina, jump in um, whenever you want. So this, these two questions are from Paige uh, Steinort, and Paige says they spoke to Greg Woods, and they believe he said that the a few younger devils are immune to the cancer. Do we know why or why not? Um, younger devils are the ones that are persisting in the landscape, and then I'll have a follow up question about vaccines. I'd say harass Greg Woods about it. He's retired now, so he's got lots of time to answer questions. <laughs> um, no, but De Greg's been studying the, the devil's immune system for a long time now and, and knows a lot. Um, and if you know him, go back to him again. But what I would say is that in the wild, there, there's not many older devils. So the ones that are getting it are younger. So that's where we do expect to see the, um, the resistance or the tumor regressions. Um, some other things, some research out of the, the group from University of Sydney um, with Juan Wan Chen and Kathy Belov and Carolong Hogs show that um, as the devils get older, they have reduced diversity in their T cells. So that's a bit technical, but what that means is there's less, less different types of cancer killing cells as they get older. So that could be a factor in it. And another thing is that as a person or a devil or any other animal with an immune system like ours is developing, the immune system changes over time. So it might be very good at fighting some things when they're younger and less good at, their, at fighting them when they're older. And, with COVID right now, we see it's, it's mostly killing older people at a much higher rate. So um, it's, a, it's a similar process. We don't know all the ins and outs of it yet, um, but it's not too surprising that young devils would be better at, at fighting the tumor. So we'll look into and try to find the, the molecular mechanisms of how that happens. And some other groups will look at the genetics and some other groups will look at the ecology to see if there's something different there. So we're coming at it from a lot of different angles. And Paige has also asked if the vaccine, uh, would the vaccine wear off after some time and need to, and have the devils need to be revaccinated or because they have a short lifespan, that's not really necessary? Uh, very good question. So with vaccines, generally, when you can get a booster, um, that's a good thing and it'll help stimulate a stronger response. And that goes for most types of vaccines that have been developed. Um, with the COVID vaccines, everybody's hoping for a single shot vaccine, but it might be that we need two of them to, to have the immunity you need to be protected from COVID. And with devils, that's one of the good things about this oral bait vaccine approach is you can actually deliver multiple vaccines to them. Um, so you could give them 
um, an initial one, you could do a vaccine distribution in a given area, say right before the breeding season and try to induce some immunity in the mothers before they have their, their offspring. And then maybe another one afterwards to boost either the mothers or give the young devils when they first come out of the pouch a bit of immunity too. So that's one of the good things about this approach is there is the potential to give a booster and it will take a lot of work in the lab and then a lot of work in, in captive studies before that's ready to go in the field. Um, but it's a good question. Evie has a question that I think you'll hate, but nonetheless, because you're not getting any special treatment, do you have an estimate to when this vaccine might be ready? <laughs> the COVID one? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think they mean the devil one, yeah, but if yeah. you know, tell, the, tell us about the COVID one too. <laughs> um, no, with, with the devil one, I would be um, much too bold to suggest a date of having the vaccine ready. What I will say is that the, the the pace we can do our immunology and vaccine research at now is vastly accelerated from when we first started, from Greg was first starting and we didn't even have any antibodies for devils. So now we have um, dozens of antibodies. We can look at multiple components of the immune system at once. And we have um, postdocs like Amanda Patchett leading bioinformatics approaches. So we can learn a lot. We can do this really fast and all the timelines are getting shortened now. That said, this is a tall order to do this. It may not work at all, in the process, we're going to learn a lot of useful things, though, and hopefully we can apply some of these things to um, helping protect other species and even translating back into human medicine and learning some inter interesting treatments or vaccine approaches for human cancer. Hopefully it does work. <laughs> hopefully it does work. Absolutely. Um, some questions for James. Uh, Tanya Rose Warren is wondering what the weight of the backpack is. Um, and I'll, I'll broaden that a little bit to say, do we know if attaching this backpack to them has any impact on their behavior and their flight? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so the, the transmitters themselves weigh about 65 grams, um, which isn't that much for an eagle because they can uh, carry, well, when we we're giving the eagles lunch, for example, um, after we have put the transmitter on, they could eat up to 500 grams of food. So they can carry a lot of weight. Um, but the key is that it needs to, there was previous workers put trackers on wing, on uh, tails and also legs and things like that. Um, but it really messes up their um, their weight for when they're flying. Um, so that's why not just in wedgies, but in eagles throughout the world, they've kind of settled on this backpack design because it keeps the weight central to the bird and it shouldn't affect their behavior. Um, but it's a, it's a difficult thing to quantify exactly because we don't, we can't compare it to anything because we'd have to put one on to, to compare it. Um, so we don't think it does, um, and everything suggests it doesn't. But we wouldn't know 100% whether there aren't slight effects on the bird. Okay, and one more about the eagles. Um, in your videos, there was a lot of circles that they seem to be oh, flying yes. in circles. Why do they fly in circles like that? <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so that's, uh, well, even when we see them flying around, they do that a lot. So they're using um, thermal updrafts, um, so just columns of warm rising air. And because it's, you know, they're big birds, it, they want to save energy as much as possible. It just allows them to gain altitude without having to flap their wings. So very rarely, do you, well, less often do you see a bird, an eagle flying, flapping extensively. It's just soaring around using either the wind direction or these updrafts to just gain altitude. All right. Um, I have... Two quick ones for uh, Jamina, and then I'm gonna ask broadly of the panel a couple of uh, good questions that people have, have raised that, that apply to all of you. So uh, quickly, is Macquarie Harbor still an issue for the handfish? Um, so I think this comes from, like there was reports that there may have been handfish in that area some time ago, but I don't know that that's ever been con confirmed. So we don't know if, if they're living in Macquarie Harbor or we don't know if Macquarie Harbor is causing problems for them. We don't know if they're there. Okay. Um, and then a question, another question for you. How do you prepare the young fish uh, for, the, for being released into the wild? Is there anything that you can do to increase their survival before um, sending them out on their own? Yeah, that's a good point. And there are generally two lines of thought with this sort of thing, although there really hasn't been a lot of um, this kind of work with marine species, but you can either, you know, release fish or, or animals with no prior training and just kind of hope for the best. And that's sort of known as a hard release or you can do a soft release. And that's where you, you do attempt to acclimatise them to conditions. And we are going down that avenue. However, given we are lacking a lot of information about the general biology, that's quite difficult to do. So what, we, what we're doing is we're 
increasing their habitat structure because when they were first hatched, we sort of kept them in quite sterile conditions because survival was the greatest priority. But now we've, we're increasing their habitat structure and getting them used to being around the sort of structures that they're going to be in in the wild. They're feeding well on live food and we've switched prey types along the way and they've had no problems doing that. And we're also now building up to the stage where we introduce them to a number of other species and uh, seaweed types that they're likely to encounter in the wild. So I guess giving that, them that taste of what they're in for before we release them. So that is a really good question. And the second part of that was um, how, how old are we, they when we release them? The ones that we've got at IMAS will be almost a year old and the ones we've got a bunch at Seahorse World who are looking after them as well and they're a little bit older so they'll be almost two years but we don't have hard data on how uh, when they reach maturity we think it's just after two years. Okay I have one from Nessie Van Loan and this is for all of the speakers. She's got um, little kids at home and is wondering what sort of books children's books or resources there are for teaching kids about these threatened species. Does anyone know of any? Yeah, oh. I sent, sorry, I sent through a, a, a children's book called, I think it's called Hold On. It's um, produced by Syro, and I sent that link through to Nessie just a few minutes ago. I will add in my two cents. I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old at home, and we've had various Tasmanian devil books over the years and other endangered species and threatened species books. Some of them are very good, and some of them are less entertaining for the adults, I would say. Um, but what what we try to do is we spend our weekends and nights outdoors getting the kids dirty getting them looking for animals flipping over rocks and looking for bugs and just trying to get them interested in, in nature and wildlife um, and then when we get worn down and we need a break when we do let them watch tv which isn't often we let them watch a nature show um, and just trying to get them interested and hopefully that will build in them the type of um, responsible nature ethics that, that we think we've we've developed All right, James or Georgina, did you want to follow up or you're good? I have no idea about children's books. <laughs> yeah, me neither. <laughs> okay, James, are there other ways that children can get involved in the Wedge-Tailed Eagle project? Oh yeah, no, definitely. So the, <laughs> thanks for the little nudge. <laughs> um, um, so the big way for both children and adults would be um, uh, Where We're Wedgie, which is a big citizen science project to get people out there and do these surveys to look for eagles and that's kind of hopefully that kind of information will give us um we really valuable in addressing one of those issues that we have which is we don't really know whether the population is going up or down um so if people get out and do that every year um which is normally around may time um we should start getting that information all right now we're supposed to wrap up in one minute so you've each got about 30 seconds to answer this question I know technically that math doesn't work out, but nonetheless, can each of you identify one thing that the general community could do to help your species? Um, well, I've, I've got, well, as well as participating in Where We're Wedgie, I, this would probably be something that would be um, relevant to devils as well, which is um, using rat poisons. Um, so we haven't, uh, we've found during my research that a lot of the eagles have got rat poisons in them. Um, and they're particularly a second second generation. Um, there's two types of rat poison, first generation and second generation. And you can look up which category these two fall in, but the second generation ones are really bad and they're very persistent and they'll be traveling through the food chain. So not only would it be eagles eating that, but devils most likely would be too. I would add in, um, this is not, again, just for devils, but keeping your cats inside, keeping dogs on lead, and driving slow at night is good for a lot of species. Georgina, anything to add about devils? Um, yeah, I was just going to say drive slow at night as well. And if you see a wallaby or possum on the road, yeah, just stop the car, drag it off, because devils mostly scavenge, so they'll go down to the road and they'll scavenge on that car because they could get hit themselves. Mm. So, yeah. Jamina? Um, no, just as I said, I think 